we live in a dangerous world. And we try to forget about that. There are dangers of all kinds. Just being in the universe. I was reading the other day about gamma ray bursts. Now Earth apparently was subjected to one pretty severe one. If it happened today, all our electronics would be fried. And if it came from some stars that were nearby, Earth would be fried. And there were asteroids, all kinds of stuff. So just being on Earth, what a dangerous place. Living in human society is even more dangerous. The things that people can do to us to harm us physically, that's one thing. But the things they can do to harm us mentally and emotionally, that's a lot worse. And the worst things they can do would be to get us to do unskillful things. And our mind is so susceptible to other influences outside that we need protection. This is one of the ways in which the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha give us refuge. They give us standards to stand against those of the world. When the world says that wealth is the best thing there is, power is the best thing there is, beauty, fame. The Buddha says, no, those things will change on you. And to get those things, you can often end up doing some really unskillful things. We'll have a long impact on you. The Buddha has you think about that long term. Remember the question that lies at the beginning of wisdom and discernment, what when I do it will lead to my long term harm and suffering, but when I do it will lead to my long term welfare and happiness. When the Buddha says long term, he means really long. Our unskillful actions can have an impact not only in this lifetime, but on to future ones. And it's good to keep that perspective in mind. That protects us. The Buddha talks about teachers providing protection for their students. That's one of the duties of a teacher. And this is the kind of protection the Buddha gives us, ways of thinking, ways of looking at the world, to help us see that being skillful, being heedful, being harmless really are activities, standards, values worth pursuing. That's one level of danger. That the Buddha has to protect ourselves from. And then we think about just the uncertainties of human life aging, illness, death. Those things could come at any time. So he goes on to provide us protection against that. First, he provides protection against going to bad places when we die. We're creating bad places for ourselves here on, here on Earth. Here again, his standards in terms of virtue, concentration, discernment. He's helped to protect us against our doing unskillful things, thinking unskillful things, saying unskillful things. Because the uncertainties of the world are nothing compared to a mind that's uncertain, that can't trust itself. And so we have to learn how to make ourselves trustworthy. This is why the precepts are such an important part of the practice. You learn to make a promise to yourself and then stick with it. And you'll see there are parts of the mind that are traitors. They don't want long term. They want short term. They want happiness right now. And if the path were simply one of holding by the precepts, it wouldn't last long. So we need concentration. As the Buddha describes concentration, it's basically feeling tones of pleasure, rapture, a calm of equanimity. After the mind has been nourished with pleasure and rapture, it's a way of feeding us, feeding the mind. So it's not so hungry for quick fixes. That way it can learn to trust itself more.
But even then, we're still subject to further dangers, just the simple fact of aging and loss and death, acting in skillful ways on the mundane level. Can't protect us from those dangers. And who knows, when you die and go someplace else, you may forget everything about the Dharma. There may be an inclination in the mind if you develop it that direction. But sometimes the shock of death and rebirth can be so great, there's a huge blank. It's going to take a while. This is why we have to be protective against our own skillful actions. In other words, skillful actions that are not on the noble level. This is where discernment comes in, building on concentration. So we can learn how to see how the mind shapes its experience. There's a passage where the Buddha says insight gets developed when you ask the right questions about fabrications. What are fabrications? How they should be regarded? How they should be seen with insight? And you want to learn how to look at your emotions as you go through the day from that perspective. How are they fabricated? The Buddha gives you a list. There's bodily, verbal, mental. Bodily is the way you breathe. Verbal is direct to thought and evaluation, how you talk to yourself. Mental is perceptions and feelings, the labels you put on things and the feeling tones that you focus on. And your emotions are composed of these things, and you want to learn how to see them that way. They may be old habits, and we say, well, something we've done for, since childhood that's really going to be hard to dig out. Well, it's not just since childhood. A lot of these habits go way back. There's a belief among John Lee's students that he was King Ashoka reborn. When I learned that, I was able to obtain a biography of Ashoka that had some of Ashoka's edicts translated in the back. So I translated them into Thai, I read one of them to John Fuang, where Ashoka is talking to his government workers and saying, if you want to please me by how quickly you know what I want, you should know what I want before I do. Then John Fuang's comment was, 2,000 years it didn't change. Sometimes our habits go way back, but that's no reason to think that they're too strong to dig up, too strong to change. And John Suat has a nice image. He says, you go into a cave. Imagine the caves of Lascaux that for thousands of years had remained closed. And somebody goes in with a light. And the darkness in the cave can't say, well, we've been dark all this long. You have no right to chase us away. Once the light comes in, the darkness has to go. So you want to bring some light to your emotions. This is how you can undo those habits. Even the skillful habits are composed of these things. But first you want to get good at undoing your unskillful emotions, because these are the things that make you untrustworthy. Talk about the world being uncertain. If you can't trust yourself, to always do the skillful thing, always do the thing right in line with the precepts. You're really in a precarious place, much more precarious than the earth, subject to gamma ray bursts. Your mind has defilement bursts, and they're happening all the time. And they fry your goodness. So you have to learn how to take them apart. To what extent does the way you breathe around them aggravate them? To what extent does the way you talk to yourself around them aggravate them? And one of the number one things you've got to learn is the voice in the mind that says, well, this is old, this is deeply entrenched, I can't deal with it, I can't fight it. That's the defilement's first line of defense. And then when it comes back, it says, see, see, I'm coming back. But you have to say, okay, you're coming back again, but I can fight you again. One of the important things in the practice is that 
You don't count the number of times you've dealt with the defilement. You just keep dealing with it every time it comes out, as best you can. And finally, you'll be able to have an insight to see why it is that it has its appeal. For a lot of us, the really unskillful emotions hide their appeal. We're embarrassed about it. And they'd like to keep it hidden. They know that if, if it came to light that you liked a particular unskillful emotion for some pretty bad reasons. But they were compelling. They had their allure. You'd be embarrassed. And the defilement would be weakened. So the defilement tries to keep these things hidden. And here we're not here to play along with them. We're here to figure out well, why do they have that power? Why do we play along? How can we learn new ways of talking about them? Ways that change our allegiance. Ways that don't get discouraged. And of course, there are the perceptions we have around them. Say there's anger, ill will. We have to look at the perceptions we have about the object of our anger and ill will. We have to look at the perceptions we have about the anger and ill will itself. Let me tell you something. I don't have any ill will. Well, dig around a little bit. Or with anger. All too often we say, well, our anger is justified. And you can give all kinds of reasons for why the people or the institutions that you're angry about really are bad. But you have to realize, okay, the fact that they're bad may be true, but the fact of your anger is something optional. And if you want to deal with a problem, you can't deal with it through anger. This is another misperception we have. It's, we think that's because of our anger that we have the motivation to deal with problems. But if you're going to deal with them effectively, you can't do it with anger. So you have to learn how to talk to yourself about the object and learn how to talk to yourself about your anger or whatever the unskillful emotion is in new ways. So you can start taking these fabrications apart, because that's what they are. They're just fabrications. They're put together, jerry-rigged. And some of them are really habitual. But again, just because they're a habit doesn't mean that they need to maintain their power. So it's in this way. It's nothing really special, or nothing really ob obscure or esoteric. Virtue, concentration, discernment. These are the things that provide you with, with refuge. They may be unable to protect you from gamma ray bursts or asteroids. But they can protect you from doing unskillful things. And they can protect you even from the dangers of skillful things if you really follow them well. You get to the karma that brings an end to karma. Because the only really safe, secure place is nibbana. That's why the Buddha listed safety, security, the secure harbor refuge as epithets for nibbana. Because that's when you're going to be safe in all dimensions, in all ways. Up until then, you have to accept the fact that you're living in an uncertain world. But your real danger is the fact that you're uncertain inside. Now, the world will always be uncertain. But inside you doesn't have to be uncertain. This is the message of the Buddha's teachings. He was able to find a happiness that was certain and secure. And he points out the way to us. We live in a world where that way is still open. That much is good about the world right now. There will come a day when people forget 
and someone who will have to find the path all over again. So take advantage of the fact that the world does offer this right now. and see how far you can take it. <laughs>